Fabulous. Why don't we get started um, and folks can join as we go. Um, we are recording for those of you just to know, and we'll, this will be also be available as a video later on on, um, on the website. But I want to welcome everyone to our first early spring installment of the Knowledge Portal webinar workshop. Um, I think we're joining at a time where a lot of people are more hopeful and, and, and things are looking brighter. So I hope it is for you all out there too. Um, and I'm looking forward to an exciting spring and summer for all of us both in our um, personal lives and professionally. So today, you know, since we last time last time we spoke, which was uh, mid-January, we've had a really large production release of the Knowledge Portal, Portal Network, which I'll start off with talking about today. But we have some featured science for you all today. So let me just get advance my slides. There we go. So today I'll talk about, take, take about 10 minutes in the, at the beginning and talk about our latest release and some teasers for what's next for the CMDKP and, and Knowledge Portal Network. But then I'll turn it over to our featured science, which will be two speakers today our very own Jason Flanick, one of the principal investigators on the portal activity, but also really responsible for a lot of the science that goes into the portal. So he'll be talking about the human genetics calculator. And he, with him will be Peter Dornbos, his postdoctoral fellow who works with him, who's done a lot of this work. So we're gonna be talking not only about what will be, done, what will be to come on the portal, but the science of it, how and the rationale and the motivation and the approach behind the method. So we're gonna hear about that for the lion's share of the talk today. So with that, I'm going to turn to some release teasers and what, what you see in the portal today, and then we'll move on to our scientific presentation. And again, if there's any questions, please place them in the chat, and we'll make sure we get to them at the end, because I think we'll be having time for that. So first, just to, to remember, to, to orient you all, our webinars are bi-monthly. They are at this same time, and our next one's going to be in May. And then if you, if you missed any of this, you can find it on the resource tab um, in our video section. We have documentation and tutorials that run through all the different elements of the portal and hopefully keep it up to date across the portal network um, and all of our features and tools. So first today, I wanna to give you a little bit of teasers on what's on the CMDKP today. I thought we'd start with data because it's been a pretty impressive um, last six months in terms of data integration for the portal. You know, um, across the, the, the network right now, um, the CMDKP, we now have 286 data sets across 346 traits. And you can see in recent months that has really upticked. And this comes from over 120 investigators that we worked hand in hand with to represent their results from over 50 countries worldwide. And um, in this regard, you know, this has also led to manuscript submission and data-driven um, publication, publication release, re data to release for over 129 citations synchronized and synchronized publication releases. Moreover, really what the, the, the hallmark is that 71 of those data sets have come pre-publication, which just means that we are you know, working with the investigators to be the trusted space for them to make their results accessible to the world. So I'll give you a couple highlights about that first. So one that's really, really sort of close to our hearts is the AMTG genes exomes. For a while now you've had um, types of diabetes on the portal, but now you have 23 quantitative traits for which you have the um, gene level and rare variant associations available to you for query and access. That's new, that was not up there. And this is pre-publication, this has not been published anywhere. And what this really sort of gets at is the fact that, you know, we have 72 um, institutes that collaborate with us on this and they all agreed to make these results accessible. And I think it's just a testament to the diabetes genetics community that I am so fortunate to work with. Secondary also is TopMed. TopMed has finally made its way to the portal. We're extremely excited to welcome it into our, you know, the constellation of cohorts and projects that we represent. Um, we have genome-wide association results available for type diabetes, fasting insulin, and fasting glucose. This is a space that's going to be developing quite a lot over the next couple of months. I'm really excited, but this is really the beginning of making these results accessible um, to, the, to, to the world in an open access framework, fully integrated with the portal. Again, another really awesome um, signature data set now is the largest type one diabetes GWAS meta-analysis done to date. And again, this is pre-publication courtesy of our colleagues, Kyle Galton and his, his, his colleagues um, contributing it to the portal as part of the type one diabetes knowledge portal, but also fully integrated into the CMDKP. So that's also available to you. So with that, there's 20, 22 new genetic data sets available on the portal right now. So again, I mentioned those, but some other ones that are extremely exciting um, are other consortium driven genetic results, one being LADA, um, a lot of GWAS and coronary artery disease in type one diabetes, so a complication in type one. And then other data sets we brought into the portal to integrate because they're driven by the community, the disease experts who believe it would be useful to have those publicly available statistics on the portal in concert with the other data sets that we represent include the blood traits and the CKD gen UACR uh, genome association study results. 
So those are available to your query. In another area, we, we not only represent genetic data, right? We all not only represent gen genomic annotations, but also we have novel research efforts. And we've really tried to establish a workspace for that on the portal. Because a lot of times we have novel, a novel approach or novel method or a novel data set, which is either not public published or not fully integrated in the portal because either it is under development, it's um, we're thinking about the best way to visualize it and we wanna explore it and get iterative feedback from you all on what you find useful, what you don't. So to that end, we've added what we call our KP lab space. And this is really for research, novel method, data, modules, under evaluation and early adoption and possible integration into the portal. And you can find them here. They're for unpublished work, as I mentioned, beta versions. You're gonna hear about a beta version today from the huge calculator. Novel results that we haven't fully implemented. So it's a space to really get in real time feedback, but also get these results out there fast in a visual that we think is you know, the best at best at the time, but to get feedback on it so that we can improve on it and then integrate it into the broader framework. So there's four at your, three at your disposal right now, the Complications Association Browser, Custom Aggregation Test, and Genetic Loci for type diabetes. And I'll show you a little bit about the two of them really quick. So the first is an early framework. One of the things we've had been light on in the portal, which we really like to develop over time, are complications in the context of type diabetes and other metabolic traits. This is really useful, you know, in terms of looking at, you know, if you have a garden variety CAD, you want to look at what is, are there any different genes or um, variants associated with type 2 coronary artery disease in the context of type 2 diabetes. And for that, this early browser is a means to get at that. Right now, it's limited in its scope of data, but over the next couple of months, we'll be seeing a lot more data here, courtesy of our colleague, Ronnie, Ronnie Salem, who's going to bring about 18 new complication traits into the portal, a very large meta-analysis, which will be viewable through this mechanism. Another space that's really under a tremendous development, particularly as we expose, we allow you to run custom aggregation tests on individual level data that is protected and behind the firewall where we only represent results to you. And this has been on the portal for a long time, but the growth in this area is the addition of top men um, to, the, to the aggregation tool. And eventually over time, this will expand from exomes to genomes. This is a place where you can run a custom analysis get results computed back to you. So that's an exciting space. I, I encourage you to check that out. So lastly, in terms of our enhancement to signature features, what have we done to improve some of the signature features you're used to using on the portal that are now available to you? So there's two spaces. One is in our tools and one is in our, you know, your classic search for gene, region, or variant. So the first, you know, for the past year and a half, we've had effector gene predictions up on the portal for you to query. First for the heuristic for the Mahadan method, which is the curated um, list of effector genes. And then there's two bioinformatic methods up there. So what we did with this release is as a simple way for you as a user to see all three of them incorporated together, um, see where they rank amongst each other. We've incorporated into a table, all the effector gene results with the three methods for you to view, visualize and export if you want. What's nice about that is you have all the evidence sources in one place for you to peruse. This is an area of, again, ex expansion as we work to incorporate more data, update the list as we get new GWAS from different ancestries in, new annotations and better methods to really hone this list and expand the list of effector genes and also deepen it as we learn more about the effector genes that are either you know, um, causal or strong, right? And then the other thing is, you, know, you have the beautiful UI to look at the portal, but we wanna enable programmatic access. To the portal as well. And for that, um, we enable API access, but we do this through a nice environment. So if you're on the portal, you'll see this little, this little icon here, it's called Lunaris. If you click on it, it will bring you to this website, which um, Oliver Benacher and the group has done the lion's share of the work here. But what this does is allow users prescribed access to results from our bioinformatic method. So it allows you to say, I would like these results for these variants, this region, these traits, sent back to me and exported so that I can compute on them myself. So this is gonna be very useful as we expand to more methods and more traits if you wanna do your own application on any of the results we represent in the portal. So I think this is a nice, exciting accoutrement to the, to the portal. So on the horizon, late spring, again, this is what's on the portal now, what's coming? Well, we're gonna to continue to develop our KPM resources. We're gonna have some pleiotropy results coming up there, um, enhancements to the clustering, that's up there from Mary Mudler and more, the huge calculator that you'll hear about in a moment. We're incorporating new bioinformatic methods that run across all the portal traits and all the portal data sets. This includes LD score regression, the POPS method. We also will um, 
sort of many of you who have used the variant finder historically, we have a reimagining of this, which will be what we call the signal sifter, which will allow you to view signals on the portal and work from that space to then work for, see what other you know, annotations are relevant for that particular variant of interest. We'll improve our gem UI, which I'm gonna talk about in a second. We'll add different evidence sources for effector genes, which I mentioned. We have complications that I mentioned soon. And working with the community in the cardiogram space, we will have car, uh, coronary artery disease effector gene predictions curated with that community represented on the portal. I'm also excited to announce, I mentioned this at our last one, but we have available to you open access in a soft, soft launch um, setting, the lung disease um, knowledge portal which we did in collaboration with Michael Cho and Benjamin Raby to bring lung disease into an open access framework in the same way we've done for common metabolic diseases. This is a space that we will hopefully develop with them, um, with that community as we go forth. But I think that's very much interest, interest, of interest to many of you, you know, as it expands into other um, institutes of the NIH, working closely with cohorts at NHLBI, and also very relevant to um, right now in our lives with COVID-19 host genetics, um, GWAS data being incorporated into that knowledge portal as well. In other areas, right now, kidney disease is underrepresented on the portal, and I think it's a really strong um, and important disease area for us in our common metabolic disease space. So we're working with our collaborators, um, both internally and at the NIDDK, to, to look for additional collaborators and expertise in that space so that we can really bolster what we represent on the knowledge portal for renal disease. Um, what's nice, though, is we have some partnerships with folks in the rare kidney disease space um, to build a portal for nephrotic syndrome. So that's going to be something that we, part of our team is going to be working on in the coming months to expand um, in the rare disease space. But what's nice about that is some of the same people work in the common disease space. And I think this will allow us to sort of bring that community together, learn about what, what types of data sets, what types of tissues, cell types are relevant to kidney, obviously, um, and bring those into the knowledge portal and incorporate them um, both for the nephrotic syndrome portal, but also for common disease. And again, these will be open access and available to all of you, all of the all of open access to all, but also allow you to have your own space if you want to just look at nephrotic syndrome, for example. This offers a proof of concept for other portals. And one thing I want to note, working with Matt Sampson and the nephronic kidney syndrome um, collaborators, we were actually able to do sort of a new activity that we've been working on a little bit as sort of like our Skunk Works activity, which is what I'm calling stand-up portals to easily represent results. The goal of this being you have a paper, you have some results for this was a you know expression results, um, pathway-based results, and they want to submit a paper, but they want to make the results accessible right away in a place where someone can query. Well. Yeah, we have a solution for that. Um, not fully invested in the entire sort of machinery of the knowledge portal. And these data are not necessarily the right data that we're representing currently in the open access framework that we've been talking about, but we wanna make these available to the world and they're relevant to the types of diseases. So we've been very lucky to work with him to produce a very lightweight portal in like what, I think DK did it in like two weeks working with his collaborators to stand up these results, make them accessible and make that portal accessible with submission to BioArchive. Actually, I think it's through MedArchive, Med excuse me. So you can peruse um, different expression, co-expression and genome-wide correlations for these APO1, which is one of what this portal was for. So this gives you an idea of the types of spaces we're expanding in um, and because it's not only, you know, the portal started out as really a place to represent genetic data, it expanded to genomic data. Now it's machinery to run bioinformatic methods and, and, and produce, you know, visualizations and representation of that. But also, you know, if you have specific research or, or a research area you want to represent, we have a means to do that. And I think that really sort of opens us up to another community of people where we can provide access. So with that, this is the group of people that keeps us going and um, works remarkably hard every day. Um, and it's, it will be great to see you all again um, in person, but also continue to see you over Zoom. So with that, I'm gonna turn over to our featured science and turn it over to Jason to talk about the human genetics calculator. And I think what we'll do is take questions at the end soon because I wanna make sure we get through everything. Um, so with that, I will turn it over to Jason. Great. Actually, let me expand. Thank you. So I'm kind of introducing this project that's been really the work of Peter um, and Preeti Singh, an engineer in, in the group. Um, I wanted to give a little bit of context for what this tool is that we're going to describe and how it came about. The roots of it actually go back to very early on in 
the era of the AMP TTD consortium, which is of course the founding consortium of the knowledge portal. And in the domain of this activity called the target prioritization activity. So we had our pharmaceutical um, partners who gave us a list of genes that they thought might be plausible drug candidates. And we were tasked with sifting through all of the genetics data that we had in house at the time to see whether it supported any of these as potential targets. And what was obvious from the start was that by our traditional measures of statistical significance and correcting for 20,000 genes, there were no significant associations across these genes. There were many associations that reached nominal significance, for example, uh, p-values of 0.02 or 0.04. But of course, there's a very high chance that random genes will also yield those sort of p-values when you're testing many of these. So what it became clear though, as we over the years continue to analyze more genetic data and in, in particular exome sequencing data, is that these nominal associations were not simply randomly distributed across genes, but did seem to be somewhat at least predictive of genes that would have a pretty good likelihood of being relevant to disease. So you can see this most clearly in this second panel here, this drug targets box plot. These are on the right box plot is showing the percentiles of p-values in our exome sequencing analysis of eight targets of drugs that are used to treat diabetes in the market. You can see that none of them have p-values below 0.05 or so, but when you look at the gene set collectively, it's clear that the p-values are lower than would be expected. So there's some information here that's prioritizing these targets, even if individually we can't conclude with certainty that the associations are statistically significant at the individual gene level. So this got us thinking that while it's true that ideally you would you know, like genetics to give you a clear unequivocal answer that this is definitively associated with diabetes, which really comes from an exome-wide or genome-wide significant association, there might be some scenarios in which lesser evidence might still be useful to you. For example, if you have a set of genes that emerge from an experiment and you're trying to rank these for further experimentation, or maybe you have a gene that you've been working on and you're debating whether or not to advance it for further study, um, given the cost of the experiment, and perhaps genetics might be just enough to nudge you over the decision point and make the, the experiment more clearly worthwhile. So in our goal of kind of developing this, the diabetes portal was of course a major step towards it. it made it possible for anybody in the world to type in the gene and immediately get the association results back rather than having to send us a list that we then went off for several months and did our analysis on. But with the clear same gap that we addressed when we did the analysis by ourselves, when you type in a gene, you get a p-value, which sometimes can be clear, um, but sometimes is not clear. In particular, if the p-value is say 0.04, that doesn't really give you, get you any closer necessarily to knowing how to better rank a gene list or to determine whether this advances or improves the chance of your experiment on that gene succeeding. So the difference between the p-values and that quantity I just described to build some intuition, you can look at what 538 does, which is if you, know, you followed the election last year like me, you probably were a frequent visitor of this site. 531 deals with the, the type of data they analyze as polling data. So this tells you the percentage of people who prefer one candidate to the other. But of course, the fact that 50.5% of people preferred Joe Biden does not mean that he has a 50.5% chance of winning. It's actually quite involved and complicated to convert that to what's shown on the right here, which is the probability that he will actually win. And you know, 538 runs a very complicated model that accounts for all sorts of things that converts these polling data into this much more intuitive, uh, intuitive bottom line estimate of the likelihood that Biden will win. Now, when we're talking about doing this for human genetics, we're gonna not do anything remotely like the model that 538 is doing, but the statistical foundation is the same. And it involves thinking in terms of a Bayesian perspective as opposed to a frequentist perspective, which are, is what's responsible for calculating p-values, right? So p-values really represent the likelihood of data, whereas Bayesian statistics represents your belief in an outcome. So for in our case for genetics, the outcome is, it is a gene I'm looking at is associated or is relevant to disease. For 538, the outcome is candidate X will win the election. 
So the foundations for how this works is that you begin with a prior belief. That's how likely you think the outcome is before you see any data. So for 538, this is the chances that Biden will be elected or Trump will be elected based on things like the fundamentals of the economy, incumbency advantage, demographic trends, all sorts of things that have nothing to do with polling data. For us in genetics, this is more akin to what you think about the gene based on non-genetic factors, what's known about it from mouse experiments or the pathway it acts in or where it's expressed. Pretty much anything that doesn't involve the genetic data we're gonna look at. You then observe data or evidence, which in 538's case is polling data. For our case, these are these p-values that are shown on the portal. And then you apply some fairly straightforward equations to update your prior in light of the evidence to produce a posterior, which is this probability that your outcome is true, integrating both your prior and the data. And the equation is straightforward for doing that, but um, not really important today. The important thing for today is that it involves having to estimate your prior and then a quantity called the Bayes factor, which is what incorporates this evidence in a way that produces a posterior. So, we're not gonna talk about the prior today, although that's obviously very important. I instead just wanted to give a couple of intuitions as to what types of priors might be reasonable, which might indicate how you might go about setting one. So on one extreme, you could be very, very conservative and say, I want to assume nothing more than at least one gene in the genome is relevant or involved in diabetes, which seems like a fairly safe assumption, given that we know, it's, you know there's a genetic component to diabetes. On the other extreme, you could be completely subjective and say, here's just what I think based on my you know, subjective belief about the data that I have on this gene. You might, you know, you, to kind of get some intuition as to how you might go about doing that, you could ask yourself how much money you'd be willing to bet on the gene turning out to be a diabetes gene, which might, you know, go a good way towards defining a prior that makes sense for you, right? In some sense, since Bayesian statistics are modeling belief, it's okay to be subjective in some situations. Um, a more measured kind of middle road might be to um, do an order of magnitude estimate. So it's probably the case that we have more than 100 genes that are involved in diabetes based on what we've seen from GWAS, but 10,000 seems like too many unless you know, you're really stretching the definition of a disease gene to these omnigenic models, which um, you know, we won't get into today. So 1,000 genes seems like the right order of magnitude roughly, which would equate to a prior of about 5%. We do actually have a project um, underway in the group and what we hope to share on the portal with before the year is out to do priors in a more principled way. The essential idea is that you um, look at the things that you know about a gene, the properties of it, and then you try to determine how much each of those properties affects the prior of the gene um, based on a set of equations that we've worked out. And it's actually possible to estimate the degree to which information about a gene updates the prior more easily than it is to estimate a prior directly because there are many genes that have any given piece of information. And so you can do things like look at gene set enrichments and patterns of associations across genes in the set um, that we think can give you a somewhat more principled way of getting priors, which we hope over time to incorporate into the huge calculator. But for today, um, is out of scope of what we're gonna discuss. What we do wanna to discuss today is the calculator um, that incorporates the really the Bayes factor generation from the common and rare variation we have in the portal. Um, the, the calculator itself was built by Pretty Singh, an engineer in the group. Um, and Peter has really been working on this project, not just in the context of how genetic, um, this sort of approach can help um, improve the portal, but also how it could potentially help um, evaluate hypotheses from the literature as well. So he's going to take us through um, that project and describe the mechanics of how this led to the, the calculator and then um, God willing do a, a demo that will hopefully um, go smoothly. I'll turn it over to you now, Peter. Awesome. I'll stop my share and then Peter should be able to go. All right, you guys can uh, see the slides? Yes, we can. Perfect. All right. So I'm really excited to talk about this. Uh, this is a project we've been working on um, as a group for about a year and a half now. Uh, so we call it the Human Genetic Evidence Calculator or HUGE Calculator. And I'm going to give you an overview of the, the method that we built and then also a, a live demonstration of how you might use it in practice. All right. But first, some motivation for the work. Um, so um, 
In literature, we come across often articles that pose new drug targets and or genes slash pathways that are involved in disease. And a lot of those articles are focused on experiments and model organisms. So the question to translate to the human. So a really good example in a paper I recommend you uh, go look up and read because I really enjoyed it. It was published in Cell in 2017. Uh, they actually walk through a novel interaction between FOXO1, which is a protein that users. So, the, uh, so you probably uh, would do what I did, which is go to the portal and look up these genes. And what we actually found is that FOXO1 is not in a T2D GWAS locus, uh, meaning that it, um, there aren't common variants that are associated with uh, T2D. Um, in and around this particular gene, we did see some signal though with rare variants. SYN3A on the other hand was the opposite. We saw uh, plenty of common variants that are associated with T2D that are around this gene, uh, but we didn't see any signal with rare variants. So when we're looking at these results, we initially got excited because the data looks pretty good. You see some p-values that are, are, may interest you and, and pique your interest and, and suggesting that perhaps this will translate to humans. But if you dig deeper, you'll start to realize that the FOXO1 association with rare variants is not exome wide, meaning that it's potentially a false positive. It's only nominally significant. So we test 25,000 genes in the genome. Perhaps this is just a false positive that comes along with multiple hypothesis testing. Also, it's not clear if SYN3A is actually the causal gene that's driving this GWAS locus. We know that variants in, C in and around SYN3A are actually in linkage disequilibrium or LD with neighboring areas. So it perhaps SYN3A isn't even the causal gene in this area. So really what we see when we see these results are some caveats. Those caveats complicate how you actually analyze the data and, and understand the data. And it's perhaps one of the reasons why human genetics was not referenced in that cell paper Langlet at all in 2017. So this got us to really wonder, is this the exception or the rule? And what I mean by that is, do we commonly see uh, articles in literature that focus on model organisms that do not reference human genetics? So we did a broad search in nature, nature metabolism, science, cells, and cell metabolism. We looked at all the articles published over the past three years. And we looked for any article that suggested a potential drug that could be used for type two diabetes or a, uh, a phenotype related to type two diabetes. And we found 35 articles, and amongst those 35 articles, only three cited human gen genetics and only two incorporated human genetics into their uh, experiments. So really, uh, for us, it was kind of an eye-opening experiment because uh, we, uh, we, we began to see that the incorporation of human genetics in these studies that focus on model organisms does not really appear to be the commonplace. And this got us really questioning as a group, well, what's going on? So why isn't human genetics incorporated more often? And we kind of came down, uh, had a lot of ideas that all distilled down to two main ideas. And the first is that human genetic results have been historically difficult to access. Although the past decade or so, we've seen a real cultural shift to prioritize the sharing of data. So we think that this is an issue that's being, um, it's being uh, tackled right now. It's given rise to some great uh, you know, resources online, such as the GWAS catalog, the Knowledge Portal Network, to actually have this data at your fingertips. But the second one is more troubling, and that's that human genetic results are difficult to interpret. So even though you can look up this data, you have access to it, you can see the p-values, you can see the variance driving those p-values. The question is, what does this really mean? So this was the ultimate motivation that led us to de develop this framework. And just to be clear, the goal of the framework is to actually use the genetics that's housed in the portal to update somebody's belief that an individual gene they're interested in may actually translate to humans and may actually be a causal gene within a phenotype that we see in humans. And the framework itself is actually distilled down into four individual steps. Uh, and we're gonna start by talking about those first two steps, which is actually assessing the variation, both rare variation and common variation. But before we go there, I just want to reiterate a point Jason made about Bayes factors. Um, and it's important to understand what a Bayes factor is to really understand the method. So thinking from the standpoint of genetics, you may be in a lab that studied a gene for a number of years. You may have an idea that this gene is involved in a phenotype in mice. And you're curious, is that going to translate into humans? What that means is you're actually coming into the calculator with a prior idea that that gene is associated with a phenotype in human. So what we do with the calculator is define a base factor that you might use. It's an independent measure. So you come in with your independent experiment from a mouse or a cell model or uh, whatever organism is your favorite organism to work with. And the idea of the calculator is we define a base factor, which is really a look across all the genetic information we have on the portal related to that gene that's related to the phenotype that you're interested in. 
And then we combine those two pieces of evidence to give you a posterior probability that when we actually look in humans, what's the likelihood that this gene is going to translate? Or what's the likelihood that that gene is going to be causal in humans? All right, so um, the question you may have then is how do you actually define a base factor based on human genetics? And that's really the crux of the method here. And due to time limitations, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail on how we actually define all the thresholds and, and uh, the numbers that actually came that, that work into the calculator. I'm going to give a broad sweep. If you're curious about the specifics, feel free to contact me after. I'm, I'm happy to talk about it. Love it to be as transparent as possible. And also, I've been working on this for some time. So I'd love to uh, geek out with you on how we actually um, came up with all these numbers. But so what I'm going to talk about now are the strengths and the weaknesses of both rare and common variation and how we kind of use that it, to our advantage in the calculator. So as many of you know, rare variants are rare, right? So only few people in the population actually carry these variants. So the, you really have a lack of statistical power to detect an association. But the strength is that once you do detect an association, if you do detect an association, it's actually pointing you to a causal gene. So the nice thing about that is we can actually use that to our advantage and we can look at the causal gene that you are, or the potential causal gene that you're interested in. So if you come to the calculator and enter a gene, what we're gonna actually do is look at the response of all rare variants in that gene and distill it down into what's called an approximate Bayes factor using an equation that was developed by Wakefield et al. and published in 2008. And what that ABF is an approximate Bayes factor. You can think of that as the odds that the association is true, right? So the beta, and the, as the beta gets larger and as the variance gets smaller, that ABF is going to get larger, meaning that you have a higher odds that that uh, gene is actually a causal gene for your phenotype of interest. So really what we do is we take the association statistics and we distill it down into a base factor, aka the odds that the association is true. And then for rare, we call that the rare base factor, which will play an important role in step three. So for common variants, it's a little more complicated. Um, the exceptional thing about common variants is that since they're carried by many people, you have a really great statistical power to detect associations if they do exist. The downside is that since there's linkage to equilibrium across common variants, you aren't necessarily sure what gene is driving the association for a locus. So really, I think the best way to kind of walk through this step is kind of just give you uh, an idea of how this flow chart works. So if you come to the calculator and you enter a gene of interest, the first thing we do is we look through all the genetic information we have on the portal and we decide whether or not there's a significant locus for this particular phenotype of interest. If there is a significant SNP in this region, we actually assign a base factor of three, and then we proceed. If there's not a GYS locus, we actually set the base factor of one, which is equivalent to really no evidence added by common variation. So if we do have a locus though, then we proceed to ask a few questions. And those questions are inspired by the T2D uh, gene, uh, effector gene list, which was developed by Maya Hand and McCarthy. It's also on the portal. But really what the questions ask are, what are the likelihood that this gene is gonna be causal for this locus? So some of the questions are, are there a likely causal coding variant? That's really good evidence that that gene is actually driving the locus. So then we assign a base factor of 16 on top of the three. And the thing to note here is that these Bay factors are multiplicative. So you can answer the question yes multiple times. And if you do that, you continually add base factors. And at the end of this step, we multiply them all together to uh, create what's called the common base factor. And if you're curious about where these numbers come from, you can uh, feel free to contact me after the fact. We'd be glad to talk about them. All right, so step three is where we combine the rare and common variation to create what we call the huge score. So the way that this works, just like in step two, we actually multiply the common base factor multiplied by the rarest base factor. And this is equal to the huge score, excuse me. And then for this step, what we do is we actually, based on the huge score, put it into a category. And that category is really based on a posterior that that uh, gene is indeed causal for this phenotype. And these were actually derived um, in a similar way to, that we derived the numbers from step two. Uh, just a real brief overview, if you're curious, we took a very weak prior and we assume that a causal would be around a 95% posterior. And what we do is back calculate the base factor required to equal that uh, posterior. And if you are willing, or if you're able to give a base factor to equal that posterior, we actually would put it into this particular category. And there's seven categories that rank from equivocal, which is just some genetic evidence all the way up to causal, which is it's very likely to actually uh, impact your phenotype. And the thing that I really want to uh, be taken home from this slide is that up to this point, all the evidence is based on humans only. 
So we haven't incorporated anything that you might bring to the calculator. So a preconceived notion that perhaps this gene is already involved in a phenotype. And I think this is really a beautiful thing because you have two pieces of evidence at this point in your hand as a scientist. If you come to the calculator with some evidence from mouse, you now have independent evidence from human. So you can think of these as two independent pieces of evidence that you can kind of weigh as you justify potentially looking at this gene in further detail. And the nice thing about step four is where we actually combine those two pieces of evidence. And this is where we uh, show you uh, what would happen to your posterior uh, given your prior now that you know something about the human genetic evidence suggesting uh, something about this gene. So in other words, to bring this full circle, imagine you're a lab and you've been studying a gene for a long time. You have some evidence that the gene is involved in a phenotype in mice. What we actually do is we uh, calculate a huge score for you and you can use this huge score to develop a posterior. And that posterior kind of gives you an idea is based on the, uh, my experiments and also the human genetics, what is the probability that this gene may actually translate? What is the ability that this gene may actually uh, be a causal gene for phenotype in humans? And Jason talked about this a little bit. Uh, so priors at this point are somewhat subjective. Lakendra in our group is working on a, uh, a, a bona fide method to make them more quantitative. But uh, in a preprint slash paper that's coming soon, we have a few justifications to at least as thresholds to begin with. One of those being 5%, that'd be a pretty uh, a conservative prior. And the second is 20%. And that's based on the analysis that Jason was talking about uh, that was published in Flanick et al. 2019. All right, so now before we move to the demo, uh, just a quick disclaimer. The calculator as is, is currently built to provide evidence for a gene and not against a gene. There are likely instances where evidence of absence may be warranted based on summary statistics. You could imagine if we have a plethora of potential human knockouts in a gene, and we see that that gene uh, in, uh, across a population of people uh, when knocked out doesn't seem to impact the phenotype, so there's no effect, and you actually have a strong or a, a very small error bars around no effect, you may be warranted in saying that perhaps that gene is not involved in the phenotype. Uh, we uh, are under the assumption right now that uh, we don't understand the full spectrum of so-called human knockouts. Um, so currently, we really are uh, really focused on providing evidence for and not against a gene. But this is something that we view as an opportunity. So as genetic information grows, and as we get a better idea of the spectrum of human knockouts, you could imagine this could be quite impactful, where if you're looking at a gene and you're deciding whether your company or your lab or your group is actually going to spend money to look at this gene in further detail, perhaps some evidence that it's not going to translate may put this gene no longer on the top of the list, right? Maybe you'll, I want to uh, work on something uh, before that. So we do think it's quite impactful. We think that it might actually help, uh, you know, uh, yeah, labs decide which genes to prioritize future study in the future. All right, so now you're probably wondering, uh, based on everything I've said, is does it work? And uh, the answer is, uh, we think so. <laughs> so we uh, looked across eight genes, and these genes encode uh, known uh, type 2 diabetes drug targets. When we run these through our calculator slash our huge framework, we find 50% are ranked as causal, one is ranked as moderate, one weak, one equivocal, and only one doesn't have any evidence. So seven of eight have some piece of genetic evidence and 50% are causal. And we really view this as a positive result. We think it's suggesting that the framework is working as we'd expect it to. All right, and now you're probably wondering uh, where we're going with this. And that's bringing it back to the beginning of the uh, uh, presentation where we uh, began talking about FOXO1 and SYN3A. So I'm gonna do a live demo here. Uh, and before I do it, I just wanna give credit to Preeti. So we uh, sent scripts, ideas, questions, comments to Preeti. And Preeti took all that complicated information and distilled it down into a web page that's functional. Uh, she's a software engineer, engineer on our team. I just wanna make sure that she gets credit for the, uh, the uh, web page you're about to see. All right. Can you guys see the uh, screen still? All right, cool. So uh, we'll start with FOX01. So I'm going to enter FOX01 here. And then we're going to uh, type in type 2 diabetes as our uh, trait of interest. Calculator is going to query the database. And it's going to provide some information. So let's start on the bottom here. Uh, so what this is uh, right here is the common variation section. So this is uh, the step two that I was talking about. Remember, we noted that FOX01 is not found in a known locus. Uh, so uh, a known uh, a GWAS locus, and you can see down here in the locus zoom plot, none of these single variants actually rise above the threshold of genome-wide significance. When that's the case, remember, remember that's a prerequisite to get a score from the common variation step. So the base factor is set at one, which is equivalent to an odds of one, which is equivalent to uh, no evidence added. 
Now, rare variation section, however, over here, you can see we have a couple p-values that may pique your interest. They're below 0.05. The way the calculator works is it actually is going to find the most significant of these associations, and it's going to look at the beta, uh, calculate the variance, and uh, use that equation from Wakefield et al. in 2008 to actually de uh, derive an approximate base factor, which we call the total base factor for rare variation, and that ended up being 3.17 for this p. Now the combined evidence section combines the two. So we uh, multiply the base factor from common, common variation uh, multiplied by the base factor of rare variation. You can see, so it's one times 3.17. So the combined evidence is equal to 3.17. As far as the categories goes from uh, human genetic evidence alone, this is a weak category. So uh, there's some evidence, but does not rise above weak. But remember that's from human evidence alone. The real advantage of the calculator is now if you have a preconceived prior for something like FOXA1, which we do, because we know that in mice it's, it's impacts glucose homeostasis, that perhaps you can uh, justify a prior of 20%. And if you can justify a prior of 20%, the posterior on that is actually 45%, which is over double. So perhaps this is enough information for your group or for your lab to actually look in this gene and for the uh, detail and perhaps prioritize it for uh, further study. All right, so I also have up here Syn3A already preloaded. Uh, so Syn3A, remember, is the opposite. Uh, so we do see that it's in a GWAS locus. You can see there's plenty of variants that rise above the threshold of genome-wide significance. So the base factor is set at three automatically. Uh, the answer to all those questions I was discussing previously were no. So really all we have for this particular gene is, is knowledge that it's in a GWAS locus. When you look at the rare variation section, all of the associations are pretty weak. The lowest p-value we have is 0.4. Uh, so what ended up happening in our calculation is we set the base factor for rare variation as one, which means no evidence is added from the rare variance. And then up here in the combined evidence, remember we multiply these together. So the final score is gonna be three, which again falls into the weak category. But again, if you have some evidence, which we now do, that this gene is involved in glucose homeostasis, Perhaps you could justify setting that prior at 20%. And if you can do that, again, you over double the probability that this gene is potentially impacting type 2 diabetes in humans. All right, with that, let's uh, wrap up here. And uh, so we expanded this, uh, this, uh, the calculator to our literature search. We found across 52 genes we identified in those five journals over the past three years or so. Uh, 19 of them had some degree of evidence, and nine of them uh, went up to the weak category. Nothing went beyond weak for uh, human evidence alone. A couple of genes that actually drew our attention, which we found pretty interesting, were ATG16L1 and P10. So they had pretty high pr uh, posterior probabilities, uh, assuming a, prob uh, a prior probability of 20%. We dove a little bit into literature and found that ATG16L1 deficiency is linked to insulin resistance in humans. We also found variants in P10 are associated with a monogenic form of increased insulin sensitivity. So we do think that uh, across these genes that we uh, identified in our literature search, a few of them are of particular interest. But really the take home and kind of the eye-opening experience with this was that most of them actually lacked genetic support. And the question is, how do you interpret that? And the answer is with extreme caution, like all things. Uh, so uh, we just want to ensure that a, a low huge score does not automatically reject study or should not automatically reject further study of a gene slash protein slash pathway. Remember that human genetics uh, do have limitations. It's not a perfect model. Variants are inherited at birth and they don't necessarily mimic what a response to a treatment might be. Uh, genetic associations, they're calculated typically under additive models. That's not always, uh, you know, within the realm of true biology. Uh, deleterious effects are going to be selected against, particularly for core genes that are very important for phenotype. Organisms aren't going to uh, be able to handle those and tolerate those types of variants very well. And finally, genetic effects are population specific, specifically for common variants. And um, you may not capture the response in underrepresented groups um, until we get the full spectrum of genetic information across uh, the world. So with that, uh, we want to conclude, and, and, and there are limitations, but we still believe that this is a value complement to experimental model, uh, model organism research. You can imagine that uh, further evidence suggesting that a gene could be involved in humans uh, could be uh, uh, very exciting for a group and could help prioritize genes in an effective way. Uh, we designed the calculator to be gene-centric. Uh, it, it queries the largest GWAS and whole exome sequencing data sets available in the portal. Uh, so uh, you have plenty of uh, data at your, at your fingertips that we're able to query. 
It's web-based, it's gonna be freely accessible and it distills all that information into an interpretable way for a user. So ultimately we give them just a, a slide bar that's, you know, where's the evidence? Um, and then we also have that final plot, which you can actually look how uh, the uh, genetic evidence would impact the posterior over a range of priors. And finally, um, it's currently built for type 2 diabetes, and we're in the process of scaling it for other phenotypes. It's nearly there. Uh, uh, there's some caveats to that, but we're in the process of, uh, um, you know, working through those caveats. And finally, we predict that this uh, will help prioritize genes in an effective way and hopefully will be useful for labs, particularly labs that focus on model organisms. And I'm a postdoc, so I want to say that there's a paper to follow, so uh, be on the lookout for that. And finally, uh, some acknowledgments. I want to give a big thanks to Jason. We've been shooting ideas back and forth for a year and a half now, so uh, it's uh, finally coming to, uh, to fruition. Uh, Preeti developed that web page uh, that you saw. So uh, a big thank you to Preeti and a big acknowledgement for uh, taking all the information we sent her and distilling it down into a web page. And Mark McCarthy and Jerry Rotter uh, gave us some great comments on the method and, and the, the calculator and how we could improve that. And then also thanks to, to many other people that were involved. With that, I am done. So I'm gonna stop sharing. Give it back to Noel. Wonderful, thank you, Peter. Thank you, Jason, that was awesome. Um, active questions in the chat and Q&A. I think we've answered them all that we had. we're up to, up to uh, data in terms of chat questions and Q&A, but I will open up if anyone wants to raise their hand and ask a question in, in, in live voice. We have some time for that. You guys did amazing on time. I, I'm so impressed. I, I went way too fast. So. <laughs> Jerry Rotter. Jerry, let me get you. How do I do that? Am I doing this right? For it. How do I give him? Oh, wait. Sorry, folks. Trying to figure out how to allow you to unmute yourself. Uh, looking for Jay. Where is he? I'm trying to find you in the list of attendees. Sorry, Jerry. Oh, there it is. All right. All right. Jerry, sorry. On mute. Can you hear me now? Here you are. Hi. Okay. An interesting example of how in control you are. Okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, so, uh, Peter, very nice talk. And uh, uh, so, uh, what occurs to me is there's something else that you haven't put in in your waiting here. And it comes right out of what you showed of the eight examples of therapies with, uh, with defined gene targets. And four of them were definitive. But three, the other four had the differing scale. So in a sense, that's information that weights the value of the prediction. It's another base factor um, that you haven't incorporated yet in the overall model. What do you mean by that? The fact that there's like an like the ratio of those known targets that are actually correct. You're saying? Yes. That is. That is, you know, in other words, human genetics failed right. in the case of DPP4. Uh, so, you, so you sort of have to, uh, so it, you have real world data there. It's not huge real world data, but it's not bad. It's eight different, eight different samples. Four were terrific, one on one. one I, I need the slide to go over in, in detail, but uh, obviously DPP4 failed completely human genetics, absence of evidence. So you could have absence of evidence and of course have a real version. So it says um, that some aspect of this weighting needs to almost be weighted again. So, well, I have to think it through whether is, is that an up weight or a down weight. <laughs> but right. it, 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 it says um, uh, uh, that, that and, you, and you have data uh, and for each disease progressively over time, you will right. have this data as, right. as so, different targets go. So you could put, that information somewhere into the model. Right, I think there's two ways you could think about that. One, one way simply is that we're dealing with probabilities. So, you know, some of it's since everything's probabilistic, you know, events will sometimes just fail, right? So if we, so you can check kind of how accurate the, the predictions are based on these true examples. And it could be, you know, that that's, that's okay, right? Like if we predict that these drug targets will succeed X percent of the time, and that's what we see, I guess they're, they're, but they're succeeding 100% of the time. Um, so, the, you know, the question is like, cause you know, they, they still have suggestive evidence, I think a lot of them. So the question is, are they underestimating them and the, whether you could, you know, 
measure that from the true examples, I definitely think is something that we, we should think about. Um, you know, there's also the question of whether you can, some of this is just inherent variance in like the existence of variants that affect. Um, yes, yes. I mean, all that is true. Right? All that is true. And you can look into the reasons why. Right. Um, and that, and that would be actually, uh, that alone would be an interesting mini paper or footnote or whatever. It would. It would. In fact, so the, the interest why would be a very good, important, a, right. a short paper in its own right. But what I'm saying more broadly, you have data there. You okay. have data in the use of the portal, how mm -hmm. accurate all this is. Right. And you therefore can reweight the prediction I of see. the portal yeah. by that information to make it even more accurate. That's a good point. Yeah. Right. And we can, in fact, once you start extending that beyond you know, other just traits and diabetes, you might have a fair amount of. Yes, you, you don't, you could use in general, you could say it's disease specific, you're absolutely right. But you could take diseases and genes targets and use that as your universe, you're right. Uh, or you could say, here's here's a diabetic specific adjustment and here's a, you know, cardiometabolic adjustment and here's all, 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 all human diseases versus all targets. Right. Cancer right. may be a very different uh, ratio than than metabolic right. disease. Good point. Lipids may be different than diabetes. I don't know that you know. Yeah. But you think of those things through. But you definitely you've made a prediction here. But in fact, that prediction actually should get readjusted one more right. time based mm -hmm. on these data that you just presented to us. A good idea. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you, Jerry. Does it make more? I mean, the whole goal of this is to to help the bench investigator. So right. yeah, you put in the genetics and then if the genetics then says, oh, okay, I, I up, I, now the probability is up to 45%, but in fact, the overall adjustment uh, tends it to say it's only 75% accurate, then maybe it, it goes back down to right. uh, 35%. Uh, right. Your goal here is to be as accurate as possible. Well, right. that, that's the goal. It's not to, to exactly. overinflate the significance of genetics, it's right. just to be as accurate as possible. And then, in some I, cases, it will be dynamite. Uh, right. In other cases, it'll be uh, uh, zero. But of course, even in the absence of evidence case, that's going to be wrong. You, in diabetes alone, it's wrong one out of eight times. Right. And what I would, you know, to, to touch on some of the questions that were coming in in the chat while Peter was speaking. I'm sorry. I don't mean to, I don't mean to uh, dom dominate the discussion. Uh, there's if, no problem. If you want to brainstorm off this in a separate call, we can happy to do so. We, would like, we're, we will be sending you a revision of the draft and we'll get your thoughts on that. Um, oh but no, God. just one, one, one point I'll make, uh, well, one point I would uh, just make in light of the other questions I saw is that we, a lot of people suggested other things that could be incorporated into this model. And that is the, that is the beauty of a Bayesian approach. Like if you add independent sources of evidence, it's, um, it is possible to continue to extend your model over time. And we are hoping over time to incorporate this more and more into the portal, whereby we will be, you know, expanding this model with the data and contributions of everyone who contributes to the portal, most particularly, you know, the AMP CND um, consortium over the next five years, generating all sorts of additional methods for predicting genes, which, you know, as long as we can convert those into, you know, base factors that can always upweight your genes. And so hopefully, or not always upweight, but always be continually readjusting the weights of the genes. And we're hoping to therefore that this will grow and improve over time as we get more data into the portal. Thank you. All right, I think I saw that Sally raised her hand. Sally, can you hear? You can talk now, we unmuted you. <laughs> oh, great, can you hear me now? Yes. Great, uh, that was a fantastic talk. So actually two comments. I think this will actually be very useful for the uh, ClinGen effort. So there's so many different uh, diseases um, and essentially this is what they're doing. They're trying to see which genes are truly associated with whichever disease versus uh, one hit wonders. So there is a Parkinson's one that I'm involved in and an ALS one that just got started. Um, so I think this, uh, yeah, I mean, it should be highlighted more, I guess, just to see that this, this really can impact a lot of different diseases. The other comment that I wanted to make is that there is a slight bias that could happen. For example, a lot of um, data that gets generated prior to the study being initiated, uh, they remove samples that can already uh, be explained. For example, the data, the ALS data that's on the portal, um, much of the data, not a lot of it, but like a good chunk of it, um, those that 
could be explained by these high effect mutations that are known to cause ALS were removed. So you will have a little bit of a bias, right? So if you look up a gene that's known to cause ALS, you might, you know, you, you're going to have that like um, condition where you're actually not picking up the rare variants as much because samples that would have been there were removed. Right. That is something to consider um, because really a lot of people go into these studies is to find new genes. So why include genomes and exomes of people that you can already explain. And, and many of them are being contributed to from different institutions where genetic testing at a private lab or an academic lab were already done. So you're gonna have, I don't know if there's a way to incorporate that or something, but you might have uh, you know genes that you certainly do know are involved in that disease. They, funny enough, they may not actually come up because they were already pre-screened, right? So there's that factor to think about. Good that's point. a good point. Yeah, there's, there's, I think, many potential biases. Like, that's a good one I, had, I hadn't thought of. But there's obviously circularity and um, other biases, too, that we always have to be really concerned about here. So that's a good one to, to be aware of, too. Cool. All right. Thank you, Sally. Another question from Dr. Mercora. I'm going to unmute you as well. Can you hear us? There you go. You should be able to speak. Do you want to ask it? All right. Um, we have a couple of other questions in the chat um, from Jeremy. Um, wouldn't the model be improved by considering the distance from common variants yes. to genes? Yes. So yeah. So uh, and I say Eric asked the same question. Yeah. These are great points. So the model is very dumb right now. It's like if you're nearby a, G a GWAS hit we take a window and you're equally likely to be all genes. Ideally what you want to do is to find map um, the genes within a region, just like you find map variants, both consider their association strength, um, I guess, you know, like, which I guess in, in large parts due to proximity, like for instance, you take a magma score or something. So I haven't, we haven't yet figured out how to convert like, um, you know, proximity or more general type of like multiple associations in the region into like a Bayes factor type of approach. There's been some work, I, I think on like TWAS type approaches that have done that. Um, but absolutely, that's what we would love to do. So I think you, you really want to have like almost a credible gene set where, you know, starting from just the proximity would be the way. To, we have some ideas on that we can talk to you about, but you have to start positing um, some sort of model as to how um, the cause out, as how to, you know, the, the, the decay of signal as a function of distance from the causal gene, um, which we are exploring in the context of that priors project and have some idea. All right, PQT, that's actually a, not a bad idea. Yeah. yeah. PQTL data for the distribution. I can hear you now, guys. I don't know if I can ask the questions. We have yes, time. Please do. Uh, very quickly. So uh, it seems like in at least some of the, especially for the common variants layer of this, there's still some major curation uh, uh, scoring, which is, I'm totally fine with it. I'm, I'm just wondering whether you guys have examined the relative contribution of kind of manual curation versus unbiased data driven uh, scores. Uh, and to see how well they match, because I'm mainly thinking about extending this to other diseases where the cause of biology may not be so clear as in diabetes, yeah. and where right. some of the dogmas of the community, which keep creeping back in, may actually be detrimental rather than informative. So I'm wondering whether right. there are ways of, of comparing the two uh, to get a feeling as to whether we understand biology and how the relative weights uh, that, uh, play into this. Yes, right. Point. You're talking about the, the regulatory evidence, yeah. right? And the and others, but regulatory is one of them, for example. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. yeah, I mean, so just to answer that quickly, since I know we're at time, um, that's the, the data driven approaches that I've that we currently I, we've thought about mostly this in the context of the effector gene list. They're right. clearly very complementary, that the call that the data driven approaches are much more statistically, um, you know. They, they do a good job of statistically differentiating known positive genes from the, the negative, but the genes that are at the top of those are never the genes that, like, the genes that, like, if you were to ask anybody who studies diabetes, GWAS, list me 20 genes you know about, they're never, they, they, they don't appear, like, as the top 20 genes, whereas you look at the manually curated lists, and they do, but they're not in a, they, you can't convert those very easily to, like, actual computational methods. So, our hope, you know, the AMP-CMD project has a whole working group and ma massive initiatives to really improve how we can predict causal genes. And as long, once, my, my hope is that that will better merge those two 
approaches and enable us to take general principles, we can extend to other diseases and then you know, we can build on top of this. But that's still an aspiration at this point. So today, you know, when you're thinking about this for traits, it's basically a more interpretable way of incorporating proximity to a GWAS signal and an X rare coding variant signal. And that's 95% of the value at this point. But hopefully a year from now, we'll be able to tell you a different story. Thank you very much. It was great to work in this. You have to start somewhere. So it's yeah, I want to thank great you, to see Peter this. Peter is a great, uh, has been leading this uh, fantastic presentation. By you. Excellent. I see it. Der Jerry, did you mean to raise your hand again? So I've unmuted you. Playing with the chat, et cetera. Um, okay. But you're, you're absolutely right. We ought, to, we ought to be able to use some kind of metrics for loci, uh, uh, as you say, credible set. Uh, obviously, we have to cal it has to be calculated genome-wide, so the people are going to look up genes that haven't, it hasn't been done for. But uh, that, that will help the uh, common disease. There'll, there'll be ways to do that, probably if, you, if we uh, just brainstorm it, but enough doing that sooner rather than later, which would refine the common disease one rather than the general areas, of course. And of course, a lot more data is gonna come in when we talk about what's regulatory, what's the QTL, et cetera, et cetera. What, what is likely to be that, that gene in that region uh, in that case will eventually come in. But I mean, you know, Jason, you've made all those points. You have, as the last comment, you gotta start somewhere, you gotta start building a model framework and you uh, seem to have uh, uh, successfully accomplished that thanks to uh, Peter and uh, I'm sorry, Singh is his last name. Uh, pre yeah, pre and uh, and obviously uh, Jason's leadership. Beautiful. All right. Well, thanks for everyone's hanging in there with us. That was excellent questions and answer. I hope we answered it. If you didn't answer anything, please feel free to email me. I can field them or email us on the um, the website or Peter or Jason directly. Uh, stay tuned to see us in May. I hope then we have people more vaccinated, staying healthy, and um, you know able to attend and getting out and to see the, their friends and family. So with that, we'll conclude. Thank you to everyone and um, take care.